I'm gonna have to give you a warning on this video. Um, some of you are gonna be triggered, some of y'all are gonna be really triggered. And some of you are probably never gonna watch me again, and that's okay. Um, you're gonna disagree, some of you are gonna disagree with me, and that's okay. But I'm gonna show you some things in the Bible that you've probably not seen and I'm sure you've not heard because today I'm going to talk to you about this subject, God does not love everybody. See, we lost some already. Okay, so let's start out with Psalms chapter five. It's a, it's a, very, popular, it's a very popular myth. So let's start, even before, I, even before I get into this, it's a very popular myth, this whole idea that God loves everybody. And we feel like he has to love everybody because he's God. Well, the reality is he doesn't have to love anybody. That's the reality. And the fact that he loves anybody is the miracle. So let's don't get that part twisted. And the Bible clearly states who God hates and why he hates them. What? In the Bible? In the Bible. So... We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're just going to look at it. By the way, and he's God. What's he allowed to do? Whatever he wants to do. And he doesn't have to answer to any one of us. I don't know how a God who, lo- I don't know how, a, 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 how an all-powerful, almighty God could hate somebody. I don't know how an almighty, all-powerful God could answer to you. <laughs> or me. I'm keeping it real. I, if, if, if God has to do what I tell him to do, then he's not my God. He's, a, he's the God of my imagination, but he's not the God of the Bible. So let's read these words. Let's read these words. Here's what it says. Psalms chapter five. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. I did not put that in the Bible. It was in there the first time I read it, and it's still in there today. But watch what it says next. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. What's leasing? Leasing is speaking with the intent to deceive for the purpose of profit. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor. That means like detest. The bloody and deceitful man. It didn't say the Lord will abhor the deeds of the bloody and deceitful man. That's not what it said. It said the Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. I'm not confused. It's in the Bible. Now, I get how people like to try to make it mean something other than when it said, when it doesn't suit their theology. But now here's, here's the interesting thing. I can't, I can't look at you and tell if God hates you, but God can look at you and tell if God hates you. So I, I'm not supposed to be, go around saying, well, I hate that person because God hates them. God has commanded me to love people. Why? Because I'm not God. And I can't do everything he can do. Okay, Psalms chapter 11, verse number one. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string they may, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. The foundations, if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold his, as his eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous. But the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. That's strong. That's strong. That don't sound like God loves everybody to me. Oh, there, but wait, there's more. There are more places in the Bible where God talks about who he hates. In fact, let's look at some of them. Let's go over to Romans chapter 9, because I don't want this to be about Myron's word. I want this to be about God's word. Okay? Romans chapter 9, and it says in verse 10, 
And not only this, talking about not only um, Sarah and Abraham, but not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose, everybody say purpose, of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Did y'all hear that? Before they were born. Okay, let's back up again. I'm going to say something else I said already. God has to love everybody. He doesn't have to love any, he doesn't have to love anybody. The fact that God loved, if God only loved one human who's ever lived upon the earth, that would be more than they deserved it. Because there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Do I need to continue or do we get it? The scripture tells us that even our righteousness is as filthy rags. Our good deeds are disgusting, nasty, and gross. And we think God has to love everybody. And we think, we think he has to be fair. It's interesting. One of the things the rabbis teach is there is not a biblical Hebrew word for a concept. That concept is not a real concept. Like there's no biblical Hebrew word for coincidence. You know why? Because there's no such thing. There's not a maverick molecule in this entire universe. It is all under his sovereign control. But there's also no biblical Hebrew word for fair. You know why? Because fair is not a real concept. It's a man-made construct. And no, God is not fair. And life is not fair. Deal with it. So, then it says, I'm going to read that part again. It says, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And then Paul read everybody's mind who would read that verse under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And here's what he said. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. You know why you have so many proud Christians? Because they think they chose God. That's why you're so proud. You're proud instead of thankful. You're proud instead of grateful. When you understand there was nothing in you looking for God. There's none that seeketh after God. No, not one. You are not, when I found God, you didn't find God. All the, and all these people talking about, uh, just give your life to Jesus. Don't even get me started on that heresy. Salvation is not a gift we give God. Salvation is a gift God gave us. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't receive salvation when I gave my life to Jesus. I receive salvation because I recognize that Jesus gave his life for me. And I put my trust in his work, not mine. Is that too, is that too biblical? <laughs> wait a minute, but wait, there's more. And then it says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith unto Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, I will, on, I will, on, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose, everybody say purpose. Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up that I might show my power in thee that my name might be declared through all the earth. Therefore, he hath her mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will he hardeneth. I don't know about y'all. When I first read Exodus when I was a teenager, and it said he hardened Pharaoh's heart and then he judged him and then he hardened Pharaoh's heart and then he judged him. I'm like, that's not fair. That, that's what I thought. That's not fair. See, what you don't understand is God's not, he has no interest in being fair. None whatsoever. So, here's what God loves. God loves his purpose. 
Did I say that too fast? God loves his purpose. He doesn't love my purpose. He loves his purpose. And when my purpose is yielded to his purpose, then he can love my purpose. But God loves his purpose, period. Now watch this, because it, it, it keeps going. He, he's, he's like, he said, I ain't going to leave you hanging. God said, I made Pharaoh, and I made him the most mighty man on earth, so when I came and knocked him down, everybody would know I'm mightier than the mightiest man. But thou wilt say unto me, oh, um, or let's read verse 18. Therefore he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? This is one of my favorite answers in the Bible because this is not serving the God of our imaginations. Here's what Paul said. Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? What does that mean? How dare you ask God why he finds fault. He finds fault because he's God. Okay, but he, did, he, didn't, even, he didn't even stop there. He says, he said, let me illustrate it for you. Hath the potter, hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump, of the same dirt, of the same clay, of the same earth, of the same lump of clay? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make a vessel, make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Doesn't the potter have power to make vessels that he's going to display and vessels that he's going to destroy? He's the potter. We don't like the way that sounds. But man, I'll tell you what, when you realize that he didn't have to save you, and he didn't have to call you, and he didn't have to show you his truth, and he did, it gives you a level of appreciation that you can't have when you think you chose him. Wait a minute. There's more. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had for a prepared unto glory. What does that mean? That means if God loves everybody, his love has no value. God made the vessels of dishonor to show his love and mercy on the vessels of honor. Why? That's the contrast. If you want to know exactly what I'm talking about, men, ask your wife, do you love me, baby? And she says, you know I love men. That is not the answer you're looking for. Ladies, ask your husband, do you love me, baby? Oh, you know I love women. That is not the answer she's looking for. The fat, the thing that makes the love that a man has for his wife or a woman has for her husband special is they're the only one that gets it. Mm, I wish I had some help in here, oh Lord. And then it says that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. He, hath, he as he saith in Osi, I will call them by my, I will call them my people which were not my people. Call her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, you are not my people, there shall they be called the children of God. Well, here's what God loves. God loves his purpose. Why? Because just like it says in Psalm 115.3, but our God, he is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Why does God do what he does? Because it pleases him, period. Why do you exist to please God? Why do I exist to please God? You ain't gonna like this. Why do bad things happen to please God? Why do painful things happen to please God? I don't like that, deal with it. Thou, Revelation 4.11, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. 
for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are, and they were created. God is not here to please you. He ain't here to please me. God does what God does to please himself. We don't like that because, but what about, but what about, but what about? There is no what about. There's only God. You know, I love what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to Nebuchadnezzar. We are not careful. They said, he said, if y'all don't bow down, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to kill y'all seven times deader than anybody's ever been killed. We're going to heat the fiery furnace seven times hotter. And they said, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us, and he will. That's not my favorite part of the response. You know what my favorite part of the response is? What came next? But if not, we're still not going to bow. See, here's the problem. We have way too many if-only Christians and not enough but-if-not Christians. Hmm? I just, I'm, I'm just mad at God. And what gave you that right? You're, you're confused. You are delusional. You, are, you, are, you, have, you have magnified the image of yourself to a place where it does not belong. God loves his purpose. He does what pleases him. But you know what else God loves? God loves his principles. Let's look at um, Psalms chapter 45. It's right after chapter 44, Myron. Thank you for sharing. Okay. <laughs> Psalms chapter 45. Verse number seven. Thou lovest righteousness. Why does God love righteousness? Because righteousness is a characteristic of God. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with oil of gladness above thy fellows. That's a prophecy about Christ. God loves righteousness. God loves God's word. God loves God's truth. That's why when we love God's truth, we're blessed. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth he is scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Why? Because he's doing it according to the principles of God. Principles are God's automation. When you do things God's way, you can't lose with the stuff he used. How do I know that? Because Isaiah 55 says, my ways are not your ways, saith the Lord. Neither are my thoughts your thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and it watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth in bud. The water, the snow and the rain that comes from heaven makes the earth bring forth in bud. It causes the earth to yield. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. What's he saying? His word is like the rain and the snow that comes down from heaven and causes the ground to produce. And here's what he said. And it shall accomplish, that it may give bread to this, they may give bread to the eater and seed to the sower. So what's the purpose of production? The purpose of production is to give consumption to the consumer and production to the producer. And what does that? The word of God that rains down from heaven. It's so, this is so good. God loves his principles. Principles are God's automation. They always work because they are truth, which, and truth is better and bigger than true. See, what's true can change. Right now, we are right here in our studio. That's true, but it's not truth because this afternoon, none of us ain't gonna be up in here. But what's truth cannot change. It always stays the same. So as the rain cometh down, the snow from heaven, it watereth the earth, and it maketh it bring forth in bud. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, and it will prosper in the thing whereunto, that it may give bread to the eater and seed to the sower. So, so, um, um, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, and it shall accomplish that which I please. The word does the work. So guess what? When you work the word, the word works for you. When you work against the word, the word works against you. 
It's how it works. Why? Principles are God's automation. He's not going to change his automation for you. He's not going to change his automation for me. It does what it does. It shall prosper in the thing we're into. I said it. God loves his principles. And guess what else God loves? God loves his people. Psalms chapter 5 again. I don't know if y'all saw this or not. We're going to give some definitions to a couple of words so we can understand what we're talking about. Okay. Psalm chapter 5, verse 5. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. When God uses words like sin, transgression, trespass, wickedness, um, um, iniquity, he's not using different words so he doesn't sound redundant. He's using different words because they all have different meanings. So what is sin? Sin is an archery term. It has the idea of you shoot an arrow at a target and the arrow falls to the earth before it reaches the target. It means to miss the mark because you came up short. So what is a sin? A sin is when I'm supposed to do something that I don't do. (laughs) Wow. People say, I don't understand the Bible. I submit to you, it's not the parts of the Bible that you don't understand that you have a problem with. (laughs) So that's sin. What is a transgression? The Bible says transgression is when you break the law. So so a sin is not doing something you're supposed to do. A transgression is when you do something you're not supposed to do. You break the law. Thou shalt not steal. You stole. You transgressed. You did not sin. Stealing wasn't a sin. It was a transgression. Y'all tracking? What's a trespass? Trespass is when you go over the line. Right, when you cross over the line, you're, you're, you're breaking a boundary. It's interesting. If you read Romans chapter 7, one of the things you'll see, you'll see that freedom can only exist inside of boundaries. It's impossible to have freedom without boundaries. Without boundaries, you can only have chaos. The Bible teaches us in Romans chapter 7, to be free from sin is to be bound by righteousness. And to be freed from righteousness is to be bound by sin. I want ultimate freedom. There's no such thing. Because in order for freedom to exist, there has to be boundaries. Are y'all tracking? Okay. Wickedness comes from the exact same word as wicker furniture. What is wicker furniture? Furniture that's woven together as one piece. It's like got all these fibers woven together. It's wicker. It's, It's actually wood fibers that are woven together. That's wicker, right? Woven. Well, wickedness is when evil is intertwined with the fabric of your life. That's wickedness. What's iniquity? Iniquity is bent. That's wrong. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. I've got my mind made up and I don't want to be confused with the facts or the truth. That's iniquity. Now, we understand, right? Okay, I I wanted to go through this. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a converse, another conversation here when I read this again. It says, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight, thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing, and the Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. It's really interesting that those, do y'all find that interesting that both of those are together? Bloody and deceitful? They don't, I mean, d- bloody seems way worse than deceitful, doesn't it? But lying is stealing, and stealing is murder. Not to the degree, but what do I mean? Well, lying is you tell somebody a lie to get them to believe something that's not true, so they will make a decision based on your deception. So basically, you didn't give them all the information, they made the decision, they didn't have all the information, so you lied. And so you stole from them. Why do I say stealing is murder? Because if I spend, if, you, if I'm going to live for 10 more hours and you kill me with one hour left, are you a murderer? Are you? Yes. What if I have, what if I have a half an hour left? Are you still a murderer? What if I have five minutes left? Are you still a murderer? Oh, okay. So when you take the last five minutes of my life, you're still a murderer. Well, here's what's interesting. 
We spend our time, our life energy, our work, our blood, our sweat, our tears, our time, which is the stuff that made, life is made of, and we do that to earn money to buy something. When somebody steals the thing that we worked to pay for, they're literally stealing the part of our life that we use to earn it. That's why in the Bible, God gave people permission. If you catch a thief stealing something from your house, you're allowed to kill them because they are attempting to steal a part of your life. Are y'all tracking? So, what's that? <laughs> Not if you, you better be ready for some word. There are a lot of people, and I saw, uh, there are a lot of people who have a lot of conversation about um, this situation that's going on in Israel and um, Palestine, as it's called. Um, and I'm going to read one more verse to you first. Uh, um, Psalms 11.5. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence. The wicked, your, 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 the fabric of your life is interwoven with evil. But the wicked and him that loveth violence, it doesn't just say God hates him. It says his soul hateth. I understand that innocent people have, have died in Israel and in Gaza. I understand that. And people say, oh, there's evil on both sides. There's a totally different kind of situation on both sides. And here's the difference. I have not seen one Israeli, not one. And I've been to Israel, and I've been to Turkey. I've not seen one Israeli celebrating the death of the people who died as a result of the haphazard, irresponsible, bloody, violent, cowardly murder of innocent, unarmed people, including women and children and babies. And the people in Palestine, as it's called, are celebrating the death of people. And then you got people in America celebrating and dancing in the streets. It's hideous. It's hideous. You love violence. Here's what God says. You love violence, God's soul hates you. I feel sad for anybody who loses their life. So it's not the same on both sides. I didn't see any Israeli, I have not seen any Israeli people with children on their shoulders with machine guns in their hands, dancing and celebrating the death of people who died in Gaza. I've not seen that once, but I've seen it over and over. And these idiots in these colleges that are celebrating the death of innocent people, and they act like they're tolerant. They're not tolerant, they're cowards. They're evil, blood, bloodthirsty, violent cowards. And I'm just saying that in case anybody wonders where I stand. I stand with the word of God. And I get it. Innocent people have died in, innocent people have died in Gaza. But they died because of the irresponsible nature of the government that allowed those savages who murdered innocent people to harbor themselves under the city streets and buildings of the people who live in the country that they are supposed to serve. So, God does not love everybody. If you think God loves somebody who's going to come into somebody's house and kill them in their bed, you are delusional. If you think God loves somebody who, who treacherously murders an innocent baby, you are delusional. And this is not about, I get it, there's no perfect government, there's no perfect country, there's no perfect anything, but I tell you what, there's right and wrong, and if you're not smart enough to see that people who are celebrating the death of anybody are the problem, you are confused. So, just in case you are of the mind that God loves everybody, I wanted to bring you a biblical word so you could understand that that is not a biblical truth. Now, I love it. most people as much as I can. <laughs> keeping it real. You don't even love everybody, but you think God has to. 
We're so confused. Okay, so I'm going to end with this. The first religion in the history of the world was founded by Satan in the Garden of Eden. You know what it was? Hedonism. Man becomes God. Here's what he said to Eve. He says, you shall not surely die, for God doth know that the day you eat thereof, then you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. You'll be able to decide for yourself what's right and decide for yourself what's wrong. Do you understand that's, the, that's what all the other religions do? See, the Bible is not a book about religion. It includes religion, but it's not about religion. God's not a religious figure. Jesus isn't a religious figure. The Bible's not a religious book. It's a governmental doctrine. It's a governmental document. What is the Bible? It is the constitution of the people of God, of the kingdom of God. That's what the Bible is. And so, interestingly enough, the first religion was man becomes God. And so now you have religions where a bunch of men decide what's right and wrong for everybody and tell everybody else and they follow it. You know what I'm going to do? I found this to work since I was 17 years old. I'm going to get my orders from headquarters. Kingdom Central. Orders from the King of Kings. And I'm going to do my best to yield to the king as one of his kings and then serve every human being I come across including and even especially those who have nothing to offer me. Because when you've done it under the least of these, you've done it also unto me. God bless you. We'll see you in the next video.